2018 is one of those very rare years when Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday fall on the same day. The last time this happened, 1945, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series. Not many Tigers fans here. Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. So we've got this time of celebration and joy and indulgence and this time of somberness and seriousness and self-discipline. Our liturgical friends who observe Lent very rigorously have a dilemma. Do I take my wife out for a really good meal on Wednesday and really let her know how much I love her? Or do we be faithful children of the church and sacrifice on Wednesday? And I'm sure faithful folks in liturgical tradition will find ways to work this out. Take her out Tuesday. Start Lent on Wednesday. Or maybe the two of you go do some service project on Wednesday that'll be an expression of your love for each other by touching somebody else's life. Thankfully, we who are not liturgical, we evangelicals, don't have to mess with that Lenten stuff. That's for them to worry about, right? And yet, there are Lenten traditions that are extremely important to many of us. <laughs> have you ordered your Fosnacht yet? Someone told me recently, very tongue-in-cheek, it's one thing that we know Catholics do right. <laughs> Stress on the tongue-in-cheek. Many of us are familiar with where Fosnacht originated. The idea was, with Lent coming and the need to get rid of fatty or buttery or sweet things in the house, we will just make these dough balls and cover them in sugar and eat them on Tuesday. By the way, you do know that Mardi Gras means fat Tuesday. That's the day you stuff yourself because Lent is coming the next day and you have to start sacrificing all kinds of things. We do that with Fosnox. And you need to eat them on Tuesday. That's the right day. That's Fosnox day. Uh, I've learned a lot about Dutch tradition since being married to a second generation Dutch woman, third generation. I guess it goes back a couple of years, doesn't it, sweetie? So we don't do Lent quite the way liturgical churches do, but why do Lent in the first place? Some of us have looked at it, some of us have experimented, For some of us, it is a very important time. What's the point of it? Why give up something or do some special service? To score points with God? You see how devout I am, Lord? I'll eat my Fosnacht on Tuesday and I won't touch another one until maybe next week. <laughs> but I'm going to be determined to do this until Easter. You see how devout I am, Lord? No. Nah. Lent is not about scoring points with God. The disciplines that we may practice during Lent are designed to help us identify and deal with those things in our lives, even good things, that might stand between us and Jesus. In the story we're going to look at today, Jesus showed some very close friends of his that even their deepest longings are not always what's best. And he gave them a valentine gift that did not look like a valentine gift, but it turned out to be better than anything they could possibly have imagined. Lazarus was ill. Jesus had spent a fair amount of time in this home, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. This is the same Martha and Mary that did the whole thing with sitting at Jesus' feet versus serving. This is the same Mary that 
shortly after this episode would pour an expensive pitcher of ointment onto Jesus' feet and wipe them with her hair. We don't know much else about them except that Jesus had a very special relationship with these three people. He would often be in their home. It was a place that he could take off his sandals and kick up his feet and just kind of relax. It was a kind of home away from home, being with these three. When Lazarus fell ill, very seriously ill, the, three, the two sisters sent that message, Lord, he whom you love is ill. The word love there. We're familiar with the fact that Greek has several different words for love, each of them expressing a dimension of love. The word that's used here is the word phileo, the love between friends, close friends. Anybody here get down to Philadelphia for the Eagles parade? Anybody else watch the Eagles parade? Anybody else wish you could have been there? And fight that crowd in that traffic? Are you kidding? I'm an Eagles fan, but... That parade was attended by people who had been waiting a long, long time, and now these men brought the Lombardi Trophy home. The crowds love these men for what they did for them. They feel like they're brothers. And these men who had been through so much together had become like brothers. This friendship that grows, that is, is tested and tried and comes through strong and determined and, and affectionate toward each other, that's what phileo is. And this was how the sisters understood Jesus felt about Lazarus. The one you love is ill. We know that you love Lazarus like a brother, Jesus, and he's desperately sick. That's all they said, but implied in that is he needs you right away. In their thinking, could anything be more important than Jesus coming immediately to heal Lazarus? He had done it for so many other people. And then the Bible says something startling. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he rushed right to their home. It's not what it says. It's what we would expect to see. After all, doesn't Jesus love this man? The Bible says he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Because he loved them, Jesus waited. Seems like a strange way to show his love. The one person in the world that could do for Lazarus what the sisters were convinced needed to be done, and he's not coming. I said that the first use of the word love is the word phileo, this use. Now, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. It's a different word there. That wondrous, inexplicable word, agape. The love that loves even if the love is not returned, even if the object of that love is not worthy of the love, even if the object of the love can't understand and can't accept the love, it still loves and wants only what's absolutely the best for the object of its love. Believe this explains why Jesus didn't rush to Lazarus' side to heal him. The miracle would not just be to heal a man. The miracle would not just be to raise this man from the dead. The miracle would be the opportunity for them to strengthen their faith in Jesus. 
Could anything be more important than for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus before it was too late? Yes. For those sisters and the twelve and the crowd that had gathered to comfort the sisters, for all of them to experience Jesus and to have their faith in him bolstered in a way that nothing else could. And we sometimes find ourselves asking, is there anything more important than my immediate felt need? Jesus has in mind always what's best for us because he loves us with that agape love. And he doesn't always give us the jelly bean we want. Sometimes he tells us, wait for the whole pack. To experience the something better that Jesus has in mind for us, there may be something you need to do in this Lenten season that will put you in a better place to receive it from him. It may be that food is in the way. This has nothing to do with being obese. This has to do with whether or not food and the desire for food and the desire to satisfy every single hunger pang that ever comes your way. If that controls your life, fasting, perhaps once a week, may be a discipline you need to begin practicing so that this thing that threatens to come between you and Jesus can be set aside and you can begin to feast on him. Maybe the thing that's getting in the way is TV. Ooh. Maybe the thing that's getting away is this. Maybe yours is bigger than mine. Most everybody I know has one bigger than mine. But maybe you need to experience a tech fast. For a number of years, it may happen again this year, I have given up bad jokes and puns for Lent. Why are you laughing? My wife is thinking to herself, I'll believe it when I hear it or don't hear it. This is a practice that I began experimenting with up in Ashland, and people laughed with me and joked about it, but the fact is I came to understand that one of the real difficulties I wrestle with something that comes between me and Jesus, is this overwhelming need in my life to sound clever. Now there's a time for it, but there's a time not to do it. And I think the thing that Jesus is trying to teach me, and I tend to be very, very slow about learning these things, is that just because it pops into your head and sounds clever to you does not mean it has to come out of your mouth. So during Lent, there may be some discipline you need to observe, something you need to give up. Please don't make it chocolate, Lord. There may be something you need to give up. I don't know what it may be for you but it's something that is preventing you from experiencing the best that Jesus has in mind. Conversely, there may be something he wants you to do that you don't normally do. We think of Lent as giving up something, and there is a place for those disciplines of self-denial. But during Lent, there is also a place for what has been called disciplines of engagement where you begin to do something that you aren't used to doing. 
I wish I could tell you how many times I have said to myself, I really should write to her. I really should stop and visit him. This is a good time to do it. I can tell you from personal experience that once you've done it the first time, it tends to get a little easier the second and third and fifth and seventh. Maybe the discipline is to get into the Word more consistently. I'm not asking you to read a chapter and pray for an hour every day. But extend the time that you're spending with the Lord. Whether the discipline that you do in these 40 days is a discipline of denial that the Lord has shown you you need to be working on, or whether the discipline is one of engagement, something you need to begin doing that you haven't done in the past. The point of Lent is to get the focus off you and on to Jesus. And that leads me to an opportunity that many of you may be interested in. If you're familiar with the name Tim Keller, He's a Presbyterian preacher. Don't hold that against him. But actually, Tim Keller is one of the finest Bible teachers in the country today. He recently retired from the church he was at. He has a DVD series called A Journey Through Lent, reflecting on Christ's sacrifice for us. We're going to be showing this Wednesday evenings through Lent, beginning at 7. And location will depend on how many of us show up. This may be something you may want to consider as a discipline of engagement for Lent. Tim Keller's got some excellent things to share. I hope you'll consider that. Wednesdays, and by the way, you don't have to be at the very first one and get them all to benefit from it. If for some reason you have to miss one, things happen. If you decide you'd like to get through the whole series, but find there's one that you miss, this series now belongs to the church. If you'd like to borrow it, you're welcome to do that. Something to consider for Lent. Mary and Martha were convinced they knew what the best thing was for their brother, for Jesus to come and heal him. Jesus knew better and gave them a Valentine gift they would never have dreamed of. The gift wasn't just receiving their brother back from the dead. They had to go through some very painful time, and they didn't understand. And they told him, so if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, I've got something better in mind. Not just raising him, but that you trust me more fully. What does Jesus have in mind for you that's better than anything you could have imagined? That there's a price to pay to find it. Pray with me.